further ado, Dr. Cohn. Alright, is that guy is that working now? Doesn't sound like Thanks so much to uh, Bill and Stephanie for having me over. I uh, really appreciate it. Hopefully I can give you some information about uh, hip and knee arthritis and the various ways to, to treat it, uh, which, of which there are many, not just joint replacement. I'll talk about that a bit as well. But we'll also talk about a lot of the non-operative options that are out there. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I, uh, I went to undergrad here. That was kind of my introduction to the Upper Valley. Uh, I uh, then uh, taught English for a couple of years at a, at a boarding school, and then I went to med school down at Yale and came back here to do my residency, and did my residency up until 2012, and then went out to Vancouver, British Columbia for a year to do a fellowship and came back afterwards. So I've been here uh, since 2013. I spent my time between Dartmouth and the VA for a couple of years, and now I'm at Dartmouth full time. Uh, I do uh, hip and knee replacements, and put an ankle reconstruction and do some trauma work over at TH as well. So we're going to talk about hip and knee arthritis, we're going to talk about uh, various ways to treat it, and hopefully the computer is going to help us out. There we go. Alright, so the things that we're going to talk about, we're just going to talk about the burden of disease, how many people out there have arthritis, it's quite, quite hot. Uh, the anatomy of the hip and the knee. Uh, we're talking about osteoarthritis itself, what it is, how it progresses, and then various treatment options, uh, focus on why it's important to stay active, stay moving, uh, keep your weight down, um, all of those things that help you in life and not just with your joints. We're talking about different surgical options that are out there, the decision-making process that we have patients go through at Dartmouth, and then some things that are coming down the line if we have time. So we'll start off talking about osteoarthritis. So uh, people, there are a lot of people out there that have back and joint pain. Uh, and in the orthopedics world, we deal with folks who have uh, hip and knee pain and also folks who have joint pain. You can see the vast majority of at some point will have one of these that will affect us. If we look at lost work days, so how big an impact is this? Is this just something that hurts or is this something that affects productivity? It actually does affect productivity. Uh, and 52% you know, of the lost work days were from joint pain or from uh, back pain. And somewhere around 70% of Americans over 65 will have some form of osteoarthritis. And that's not necessarily just in the hip and knees, it can be in the hands, it can be in the spine, it can be in a lot of different areas. But it's a prevalent disease as we live longer and longer um, and uh, we're doing more and more with our bodies as we get older. So this looks at how many hip replacements were done in the United States. So we start over in the uh, 90s on the bottom of the chart and go up until 2004. And this looks at the number of hip replacements specifically done in thousands. Uh, and you can see that number climb from just over 100,000 to close to 250,000 over the course of those uh, almost 10 years. Along with hip replacements, you know, we're talking about uh, replacing joints with plastic and metal oftentimes, and the plastic and metal don't heal themselves, so the number of revisions go up too. And so uh, that poses its own unique problem we won't get into today. And then if we play that out, we look at the number of people who have uh, arthritis and who may be looking for joint replacements down the line, you can see that number just keeps uh, going up and up as we move forward and uh, the population ages. <coughs> So it's, it's important to realize that uh, you know, osteoarthritis isn't the only cause of hip and knee pain. Uh, we're going to focus on those common causes, but there are less common things out there. Sometimes referred pain from the back, impingement on nerve roots that start in the back and travel down uh, the back of the leg can cause haunch pain or hip pain or thigh pain. Um, and oftentimes pain from other areas in the, in the hip or inside the pelvis can cause what people uh, feel is hip pain but isn't actually due to the hip joint. So we're going to focus on a little bit of anatomy here with our dissected man up here. Uh, so we'll focus on the hip here. So the hip is the confluence of the pelvis uh, and the femur or thigh bone. It's a very constrained joint. 
uh, meaning that it's held tightly in place. Your shoulder joint, for instance, is not very constrained. It allows you to move in a huge range of motion, but uh, it doesn't. That it only gets able to do that because the bones aren't very highly constrained. You have a, a big muscular uh, window that is containing that. Your hip, on the other hand, is primarily um, bony restriction. So people dislocate their shoulders all the time. You need a really high energy injury to dislocate your hip. So the, the femoral head uh, comes up and it meets the acetabulum. So the femoral head is the ball. The acetabulum is the cup. Uh, both of those are surrounded by cartilage. We'll get a look at cartilage cells here with some pictures and talk more about what they do and what their function is. Um, you know, the hip we think about being everything from that acetabular cup all the way down to this ridge here between uh, the trochanters and the femur. So when we, you know, oftentimes people know someone who's had a hip fracture. A hip fracture can be anywhere in this proximal part of the uh, hip. When we talk about hip arthritis, it's degeneration of that, of that joint between the femur and the acetabulum. So if we look at the knee, so the knee is uh, the confluence of three bones as opposed to two, the femur, the thigh bone, the tibia, or the leg bone, and the patella, the kneecap that sits over it. Uh, this is looking at things a little bit more closely inside the knee. So just like the hip, the knee is covered on the ends with that smooth gliding surface of the cartilage cells. Just like the end of a chicken drumstick, uh, it's white and shiny and glistening. Uh, there's also a specialized type of cartilage in here uh, that forms the meniscus. This is a different type of cartilage. It's more uh, rubbery and it's less uh, designed for gliding. The meniscus are these C-shaped bumpers that sit on either side of the knee, and they both distribute the weight that you bear through your knee, and they help constrain the knee to a degree. There are ligaments that help stabilize the knee as well. There are medial and collateral ligaments that live on the sides of the knees. And then inside the knee, there are the cross ligaments of the ACL and the PCL. Um, and underneath, you can't see it here, but underneath the patella is also covered in cartilage, actually the thickest cartilage in the body. Um, and that articulates with the femur here. Um, and uh, and <laughs> forms another articulation that can uh, develop arthritis. And arthritis, well, the hip is basically one compartment. We talk about the knee being three compartments, the medial, the lateral, and the patellofemoral. So if we back up a little bit and talk about why joints hurt, you know, even normal, healthy joints can hurt. Uh, but pain that sticks with you, pain that lasts, pain that gets worse, pain that bothers you at night, um, that pain that's essentially abnormal. Um, people, you know, so normal joints hurt sometimes, normal joints pop and click sometimes. Lots of people come in, they say, my shoulder, my knee is clicking and popping. Is that a bad thing? In and of itself, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but if that clicking, popping hurts, then yes, it is abnormal. Um, Osteoarthritis, which we're going to focus in on here, is essentially wear and tear. Uh, over time, uh, the smooth gliding surface of the joint can break down with use. Other things can contribute to that, so injuries or post-traumatic arthritis can both injure the cartilage and disrupt the shape of the articular surface. So uh, the majority of ankle arthritis is actually post-traumatic, but hip and knee arthritis uh, has a strong component of genetics that we don't know a ton about, but uh, we know influences things heavily. Uh, but things like your weight, infections, lifestyle, uh, if you uh, run ultra marathons, that's different than if you work at a desk all your life. Um, so the joints, uh, the joint is surrounded by muscles, ligaments, cartilage, uh, and those can hurt as well. So it doesn't, pain can be due to those stabilizing structures as well as to the articular cartilage itself. Um, and if you have a degenerative arthritic joint and you get an injury that when you're 25 may have taken you a couple days to bounce back from, it takes you longer to bounce back from you, you may not fully um, recover. And arthritic pain, while it is kind of a linear process that gets worse at some rate, sometimes slow, sometimes fast over time, it does wax and wane. So people will have spikes in their pain uh, that may be due to the weather, that may be due to small injury, uh, it may be due to the activity level. It's not uncommon that the pain kind of goes up and down. So to some degree, osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease happens in all people, and it's a result of, of aging. So what happens in osteoarthritis? So the cartilage, the 
fins and begins detaching from the bone. So the cartilage are, these, are made of these specialized cells that essentially cushion and provide gliding of the joint. And unfortunately, we get the cartilage cells and we get them more born, and once we wear them out, they're gone. We can't make new cartilage cells. We can make new scar cartilage, which is almost as good, but not quite as good. The alignment of the joint can change as well as ligament stretch, tear, or scar. The C-shaped bumpers that we saw can tear. Sometimes that's a traumatic event that tears one of the menisci. Sometimes it's wear and tear over time, like taking sandpaper to, uh, to the meniscus. It, it breaks down over time. <coughs> the labrum is the gasket that lives around the hip. We didn't look at it specifically, but it kind of lives in this area here. It's kind of the meniscus uh, of the hip, and that can tear as well. Muscles weaken uh, and movement may diminish, so you may get stiff joints, and the joints can swell. People can get uh, what oftentimes is referred to as fluid on the knee. All of these are reactions from the joint itself uh, to help protect it from the effects of arthritis, and we'll see some of those in some later images here. So uh, for the Latin scholars in the room, you know all of what this is, is here in the name. Osteo is the bone, arthro is the joint, and itis is inflammation, so this is inflammation of the bone and the joint. And it causes pain, causes swelling, causes stiffness, and it limits motion. And it causes destruction of the joint. So this is one of many views that we'll see here, as opposed to that smooth gliding surface. Uh, the cartilage has been worn down, you're seeing exposed bone underneath. And you can imagine uh, that those two rough surfaces are more painful than two smooth surfaces gliding past each other. Interestingly, cartilage itself doesn't have nerve endings in it, so it's not the cartilage that hurts. It's the bone underneath that can hurt, uh, and it's the lining of the joint that can hurt. That's where the pain receptors are in the joint. So we've got some nice pictures here. So these are arthroscopic pictures. Uh, these are taken by placing a small camera on a stick inside the knee. This is looking at the inside or the medial compartment of the knee, and this is what we'd like all our joints to look like. This is looking at the femur here. This is the curve of the thigh bone. This is the tibial plateau here. And this C-shaped structure here is the meniscus. Everything looks white. Everything looks smooth and contoured. Lovely. That actually looks like it's probably a kid. So <laughs> probably none of us have looked like that. Before. And this is a view of what things might look like in a more arthritic knee. So you can see that smooth gliding surface has been partially worn away. You're looking at bone here as opposed to the white cartilage. The meniscus has that degenerative tearing to it and fraying. Uh, and there's changes on both sides of the joint. Sometimes just one side of the joint is affected, sometimes both sides are. There are other types of arthritis beyond osteoarthritis. We'll often ask people when they come into the clinic if they have uh, inflammatory arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis uh, in their family or they have a personal history of it. So it's a different type of arthritis. That arthritis is mediated at least in part by the immune system, which essentially attacks the body's own cells and causes inflammation and destruction of the joint um, aside from wear and tear. And this woman here, uh, her hands are demonstrating some of the, the common deformities that happen with osteoarthritis or with rheumatoid arthritis. It can cause more deformity of the joints than osteoarthritis, um, and can be associated with other health problems that are uh, immunomodulated as well. We talked about some of these other types, post-traumatic, so if you've had a fracture in your, your knee or your hip, your chance of getting arthritis is much higher. Uh, infectious um, it is relatively rare that native joints that don't have prostheses in them get infected, but it does happen. And that also, the cells, as the body is fighting the infection, it also attacks the uh, cartilage cells and it can wear down the cartilage there. Avascular necrosis is bone death, um, and that happens when the blood supply to the, to the knee or the hip uh, is interrupted. That can be for any numerous reasons. Um, sometimes it's a proclivity towards forming clots. Um, sometimes it's associated with excessive alcohol intake. Um, deep sea diving is another thing that, happens, that causes it. Uh, but there's lots of things out there that can cause the degeneration. So let's look a little bit more closely at what happens to the joint itself. So these are some pictures of a nice uh, hip joint. The gray here represents the cartilage. The bone has a hard outer covering of cortical bone, and then it has this woven or cancellous bone uh, underneath that makes it lighter. 
Um, so this is what things should look like, a nice thick layer of cartilage. As our thread starts to set in, you get fibrillations in that cartilage. So there are fissures that, that occur that go almost down to the level of the bone. You can imagine that creates a much rougher <coughs> surface. As things get worse, there becomes exposed bone uh, in the joint underneath. So as the joint is reacting to the arthritis, it has a couple of ways to kind of defray the, the effects. One is to create thicker, harder bone underneath. Uh, and you can see the buildup of the hard bone underneath. And the other <coughs> is to spread out the weight that's in the joint by creating osteophytes or bone spurs. So you can see some of the formations of bone spurs here uh, in the hip. And then as things get really bad, it can be uh, ground down to bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, we call it. And that defense mechanism of creating the extra bone breaks down as well, and you get large cysts underneath the, uh, underneath the hip. This is looking at things in the knee, just another way to think about it. Early on, the cartilage softens, there may be some defects, that meniscus in the knee can tear. All those problems become larger as you move forward. Sometimes loose bodies work will occur where a little piece of cartilage or bone breaks off within the joint. It's actually getting nutrients from the uh, synovial fluid itself and it gets bigger and bigger. We call them joint mice. Uh, they don't do good things to the inside of the joint oftentimes. And then severe arthritis is where you have large areas of a bare bone. The meniscus it may completely pull off or the labor may completely pull off. Uh, and this is where you start getting real limitation in, in motion. So how do we follow most of this? We usually follow it with x-rays. Um, so this is a, an x-ray of a pelvis. So pelvis is here, looking at someone standing from the front. So this is their right hip, and this is their left hip. And again, this is what we like things to, to look like. Uh, the white represents the bone, so this is the acetabulum here, and this is the femoral head, and the dark space here is where the cartilage lives. So the cartilage appears as an absence of, of bone. This is uh, different from something like an MRI, which is designed to look at soft tissues predominantly, and would show the, the labor of the cartilage to a, a greater degree. So as a hip gets arthritic over time, so we take an 11 year uh, time lapse here. So it's the left hip here that we're going to focus on and we can use the right hip uh, as a comparison. You can see that over time the joint space has gotten smaller. You can see that there's more white bone here uh, in the acetabulum. That's the body laying down more bone to protect against the arthritis. Develop bone spurs which are uh, the spurs here on either side. And there's some small cysts underneath as well. So those are all the things that we look for in x-rays uh, to to find the progression of arthritis. Here we are in the knee. So this is a, a pretty good looking knee. Again, femur, tibia, fibula, which is the bone that lives on the outside of the leg, bears much less of the weight. We again look at the joint space here in between. And even here, you can see it's a little bit uneven. It's wider here than it is here. That's an indication that there's some wear and tear on the inside of the knee. But over time, that can get worse. We've gone from a little bit of space to no space. Uh, there's that increased white uh, in the bone indicating that there's increased uh, um, bone underneath the cartilage surface. And there are bone spurs both on the inside and on the outside of the knee. That can also affect the alignment of limbs. So this is someone standing from the front and looking from their hips all the way down to their ankles. Uh, and the mechanical <coughs> access of the leg is important. We like to see the weight bearing from the hip go all the way down through the middle of the knee and through the middle of the ankle. That way both sides of all those joints are loaded evenly. It doesn't cause asymmetric wear. Again, the left side looks quite good as well. Here's a person with arthritic knee, and you can see that they've moved into varus or they've become more bow-legged, which is typical for the deformity that happens with arthritis. Usually the medial side, the inside of the knee, is affected more than the outside. And you can see what that does to that weight bearing axis. It shifts it inside, so you get an exacerbation of the problem of loading uh, the, the knee. So now you're loading it um, asymmetrically, getting more and more wear. So one of, one of the things that a total knee replacement can do is help to align uh, that axis. The, the surgery is both a resurfacing and a realignment of the, of the joint. So um, we're going to talk about treatment here. So 
Arthritis goes from early to moderate and severe, as we saw in some of those pictures and some of those diagrams. There's also a huge <coughs> broad range of treatment. And typically for the early stages of arthritis, we talk about less invasive treatments. And for the more severe stages, we talk about more invasive treatments. Things over on this side uh, are low risk, uh, low cost, uh, have the potential to help to a significant degree. Things on the far end uh, may have the potential to help to a greater degree, but also come with greater risk, greater uh, invasiveness. So things like exercise, walking, days, physical therapy, we'll talk more about those, uh, but those can only help uh, prolong uh, an arthritic hip or knee. There are various medications that can be taken, so things like Tylenol, the NSAID, Tramadol, those are all kind of in the lower end of oral pain medications that we talk about. The NSAIDs are predominantly the mainstay of treatment. Those are things like Aleve, Advil, Motrin, um, you know, there's new data out there that maybe those come with greater cardiovascular risk than we originally thought, so maybe they're not as safe as we originally thought. That can be bumped up to narcotic pain medications, those are opioid derivatives or morphine derivatives. We typically try to stay away from those if possible. Sometimes uh, we will inject a joint, so take uh, a steroid, which is an anti-inflammatory, and put it directly in the knee. There are other types of injections that are hyaluronic acid, which was designed as a lube to go in the knee. Unfortunately, the best data that we have now is that they're probably no better than injecting salt water into the knee, um, but they do help some people. And then ultimately, uh, some people get to the point that they consider surgery. So if we look at kind of the, the treatment of pain, you know, using oral pain medications goes way back, and aspirin was one of the first pain medications. Uh, that was synthesized and made commercially available uh, and was really kind of the mainstay of pain management um, 100 plus years ago. That gradually uh, developed and Tylenol and ibuprofen were developed in the mid part of the last century. Uh, at this point, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that's what the NSAIDs stand for, things like the Aleve, the Advil, are pretty much the mainstay and have the best data behind them <coughs> for helping with joint pain. We still use acetaminophen a lot. Um, I also mentioned this medication, Tramadol, which works kind of like an opioid, but doesn't have opioid in it. Um, and that's a prescription medication that uh, is another option as well. So let's talk a little bit about exercise. So keeping joints moving is important. So that exercise, the movement increases blood flow to the, to the cartilage, so it helps it uh, deal with waste and regenerate to the degree that it can. Um, and the synovial fluid, which moves in and around the joint, uh, provides nutrients. So those menisci that we talked about, only a very small portion of them get their nutrients from blood supply. The rest of it gets it from the synovial fluid. And so keeping that synovial fluid moving is important. Keeping the muscles surrounding the hip and the knee strong is important as well. So those muscles can do some of the work uh, that the joint itself would do if it didn't have support. So quad strengthening, especially the muscles on the front of your leg is uh, especially important for knee function and the movement of the patella. And aerobic activity, so uh, that can be things like walking, swimming, cycling. That can help with pain relief. It can also help with mobility. We typically steer people who have arthritis towards non-impact activities, so cycling versus running. Swimming is probably the, the best in that realm because um, it doesn't involve any weight bearing. Of course, if you don't have any weight bearing, then your, uh, your bone stock can suffer and muscles can, can suffer as, as well. But in terms of aerobic <coughs> activity, it's one of the best things out there. So weight um, is something that we focus on a lot. We set some goals for people when we're talking about trying to get them to, to knee replacement or hip replacement. And the body mass index here, which is essentially an equation of how much somebody weighs and how tall they are, uh, or how much surface area they have, is one indication that we, uh, is one number that we use to look at that. So losing even a few pounds can make a huge difference. So you put three times like your body weight on your uh, hip when you walk down the stairs and you're standing single leg, leg stance. Um, so you're not just experiencing your body weight, you're experiencing many times your body weight when you, when you step on your leg. Uh, and not to mention the fact that it has significant health improvements. And a 
and can help post-operatively as well. We know that people that are in this range here of the, the morbidly obese have an increased risk of infection, uh, malposition, prostheses, revision, if they get to the point that they're considering orthoprostate. So this is a tool that we use over at Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, called the arthritis ladder. And essentially, we like to see people ascend the ladder. We know that people who have tried things at the bottom of the ladder uh, do better if and when they get to the top of the, of the ladder and they're looking at more invasive treatment. Um, the size of the circles indicates the, the data that's out there to support things. And things that are green are the least invasive, yellow slightly more invasive, and then red is the most invasive. So this includes things that we've talked about here, weight loss, working with a physical therapist, regular exercise, and said, you know, this is an important one, the information and education. There's actually good evidence that the more people know about what's going on uh, in their hips and knees, the better they will do in managing uh, their disability. Uh, there are some things down here that have less data behind them. So like glucosamine conversion, people ask about a lot. The data on that evolves. At this point, the best data that we have is that it doesn't really help significantly with joint pain. It doesn't necessarily hurt anything other than your pocketbook. So uh, there's some people that take it and swear by it. If it makes them feel better, there's no reason not to take it. Uh, but there isn't great data associated with it. Uh, and then as we move up, there are things like prescription NSAIDs. So those are, are things like Mobic or Meloxicam, Celebrex, um, topical NSAIDs or creams. Uh, there are rare circumstances where arthroscopy, so going into the joint with a scope, um, can be beneficial. Uh, but we know that just going in to clean things up isn't necessarily going to accomplish much. And then up here, we move on to things like total joint arthroplasty. So I'm going to talk a little bit about surgical options and uh, if and when people get there. So uh, joint replacement surgery is essentially a resurfacing of the joint. Um, there are both hip and knee arthroplasties, there are ankle arthroplasties, there are wrist arthroplasties, um, there are disc arthroplasties, but hips and knees have been around the longest, have the best data behind them, uh, and are the most durable at this point. So this is what uh, things look like during the surgery. This is one of those arthritic knees. You can see the wear and tear on the inside of the knee. And what the surgery does is resurface those worn out ends of the bone and replaces them with metal uh, with plastic in between. So the prosthesis here, the white is the metal, so both the end of the femur and the top of the tibia have been resurfaced. And then living in between here where the cartilage would normally live uh, is plastic. Plastic is on the underside of the patella as well. This kind of white fluffy area here is bone cement which we use to anchor the knee prosthesis into the bone. We look at hip prostheses, again, here's that arthritic hip from before. The same concept, uh, the femoral head is resected and replaced with a metal stem that has a, either a metal or a uh, ceramic ball on it. The cup is resurfaced with metal and then typically has a plastic insert on the inside. In some cases, ceramic, um, we almost never do metal on metal prostheses any, anymore because some of the downstream effects that we started seeing in the past 10 or 15 years. There are also partial joint replacement surgeries. Um, so those can be things like resurfacing of half the joint. This is relatively rare, but if you have arthritis in just one compartment of the knee, like here on the inside of the knee, that can be treated with a half a, a knee replacement. There are also knee replacements out there that just resurface the under surface of the patella. Again, the indications for those are pretty narrow, but there are times where it's appropriate. And then there are joint sparing surgeries that are designed to realign the joint so that different portions of it are taking weight. So uh, in the hip, uh, the angle can be changed so that areas of good cartilage are contacting areas of good cartilage. Same idea in the knee by changing the areas where there is pressure. Uh, sometimes uh, some more longevity can be achieved in the knee. So what do these implants uh, look like? So this is a hip prosthesis on the left. This is a knee prosthesis on the right. Um, these are typically made out of either a titanium alloy or a cobalt chrome alloy. Um, they are modular, meaning that they come, they are, are different parts that fit together. So the stem component 
uh, fits tightly into the femoral canal. It has a head that then seats onto it. This happens to be a ceramic head. The cup uh, is fit into the acetabulum and held with screws. Both of these have ingrowth or ongrowth surfaces, so your own bone grows in or around it. Uh, and then there's a plastic liner that snaps into the cup. Uh, in some cases, revisions can be as straightforward as swapping out the head and the ball if they get worn out, but um, oftentimes it involves taking everything out. So that modularity uh, helps in that situation. Very similar in the knee, metal component on the femur, metal component in the tibia, both of those are cemented in place. And then the plastic here snaps uh, in between. Um, so uh, quality adjusted life years uh, is this concept of the quantity and quality of your life. Uh, the Dartmouth Institute has done a lot of work looking uh, at value. And the moral of the story here is that we're lucky that we have a surgical, uh, we have a surgical solution to this that helps people, the majority of people, to, to a great degree. It helps them gain both quantity and quality in their life. In some cases with hip replacements, it can actually be cost savings over time. All of these are projections uh, and, and uh, mathematical ways of looking at cost, uh, but they give us some idea of uh, where the treatment lies. So if you look at kind of the quality adjusted light years, uh, we're somewhere in between uh, open heart surgery and in play, planning a pacemaker. You know, these are big life things like stopping smoking. Uh, so there's a lot of bang for the buck that come, can come from a <coughs> successful hip <coughs> So uh, in terms of deciding on treatment, so we work a lot with this concept of shared decision making, um, which is not rocket science. It brings the provider and the patient together to help make a, a decision together. So uh, I, tell, I have numerous people who come into my office, they tell me that they need a hip or a knee replacement. No one ever needs a hip or a knee replacement. Uh, arthritis is hurtful but not harmful. It'll never kill you. Uh, it'll never get to the point that we can't do anything about it. Uh, but it can decrease the quality of life, cause pain, and be uh, a real burden. Uh, I can look at x-rays and tell someone that they're a candidate for a knee replacement, but that decision is a conversation that happens between us. And I see my job as uh, giving people the information that they need to help make the right decision for them. And we know that uh, that decision uh, corresponds with the values of both the patient and the provider, and our focus is on the patient's values. So we have a lot of decision aids to help with that. So uh, there are videos, there are handouts, um, there are uh, meetings. We do some team meetings over at, uh, or team appointments over at Hitchcock, where if people are considering a journey placement, they sit down with a bunch of other people who are as well, and they get a lot of information about the nuts and bolts of what that means. Uh, you know, this is something that is in the media uh, and is becoming a real focus uh, on healthcare in an effort to get both treat people the way they want to be treated and increase the value of their care. So just a, a little bit from, about green care. So one of the things that we've been trying to do over at Hitchcock is basically record all our data, see how we're doing, and project that out to the future and to patients so that we can tell patients where we think they'll be. That seems like a simple concept, but it's something that the medical community has not been very good at doing in the past. Uh, and we're trying to utilize our electronic medical record uh, to, to do that moving forward. And so you can do things like sign on to the website, um, and you can see how we're doing over the past few years in comparison to national norms that are out there for things like infection rate um, and whether we're giving people the right antibiotics when they need them, how long they're staying in the hospital before they're discharged. All right, I think I've gone over by a little bit, but uh, that's my presentation. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to stick around and, and help answer them. Would you go back to that quality of life chart about three or four you got it. kicks ago? That, that was rather startling, and I'd like some explanation. Yeah, so. I'm surprised that stopping smoking doesn't rate higher. Uh, so this is cost per quality of adjusted life here. So the lower numbers are better. That means that, so the lower means you're getting more bang for your buck. So stopping smoking has a, has a huge effect on your life, but doesn't cost it. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, I'm wondering if you could ask for me. Um, ask 
aspirin. We all take aspirin. We think it has uh, even been called the, uh, the, the gold standard. Yeah, so uh, probably Dr. Rourke is a better person to ask about that, about the data that's there behind, behind aspirin. Um, but, you know, I think it, it ties in with how high quality we know the data is in terms of what it can do for you versus how much it costs. So aspirin doesn't co cost that much, but if it only provides a little bit of a, of a benefit in the studies, then it can affect those numbers. <laughs> it's important to realize that these numbers are not absolutes. These just give us a sense of where things fall on a scale. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Could you talk a little bit about how long the joint, the, the artificial joints last and how that impacts the um, decision of when to do the replacement, assuming you have like a really severe arthritis x-ray? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, the basic design of hip and knee implants has not changed significantly in quite a while. There are various tweaks that come and go. Um, the best that we know, um, Hip replacement, somewhere north of 90, 95% of them are still in and working 20, 25 years down the line. That's a little bit lower for uh, knee replacements. It's somewhere around 85, 90%, 20 years down the line. Um, one of the reasons that it's hard to know where that number sits, absolutely, is that because the design changes year to year, and there are always these new products out there, you know, we, we oftentimes don't, we're not comparing apples to apples. We have similar processes, but they're not exactly the same. You, the harder question, though, is the fact that these are plastic and metal. They do wear out over time. The younger you are and the harder you are in the joint, the faster it's going to wear out. So we tell people that these are, can get them through hiking, walking, skiing, golfing, uh, without much difficulty. Things like running, we discourage people from. Um, and the younger you are, the higher the chance that you're going to need another surgery in the future. And that surgery is a bigger deal. It's a bigger surgery, higher risks. Yes, if both your knees are shot, uh, any comments on doing one and then the other or getting them both done at the same time? Yeah, so um, there are lots of different having them, versions of having them done at the same time. Uh, at Hitchcock, we will oftentimes do them simultaneously, two surgeons, two surgical teams, doing them uh, in unison. We know that that procedure gets you a, uh, it buys you one recovery as opposed to two. That recovery is a bit harder with two as opposed to one, and it comes with an increased risk. So uh, those risks are small, but they're big things like heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and so for some people, that risk benefit plays out for them, but for the majority of people, um, doing them in a staged fashion makes more sense. I've had my knees replaced and my hips, but I have a painful wrist. So what can I do with that? So uh, I, I mentioned it briefly, but hip and knee replacements do the best and have the best data about them. Uh, back wrist and ankle replacements have, uh, are, have been not been traditionally as successful. And so the two mainstays of surgical treatment for painful joints are to replace them, resurface them like we've seen, or to fuse them. Uh, and so there are wrist replacements out there. Um, I don't believe we're doing any at Dartmouth cock just because the data behind them isn't there yet uh, to, to indicate that they are a useful uh, treatment option. Um, wrist fusion is an option. And there are also numerous different types of wrist arthritis, so um, oftentimes there are other procedures that can be performed <coughs> short of one of those big procedures that can provide relief. And as, as with the hips and knees, there are lots of non-operative measures before you get to that point. Uh, I might guess the answer to this myself, but it'd be good to hear your expert sure. experience uh, observations. Um, when typically do the doctor and the patient agree to have a knee replacement? What what are the what's the situation? How severe? And it, is it, uh, it uh, is it based upon uh, well, of course, quality of life, what the person wants to do that that influences it. But just from your your experience, what, when is that knee replacement done? Right. So I think one of the things that oftentimes drives people is when they start having pain at night, pain that's waking them from sleep, that can be very disruptive. And then the other thing is keeping them from doing the things that they want to do. That's pretty broad, but for some, someone that might be 
walk into the post office every day, or someone else that might be hiking four to five miles a couple times a week. And so when people can't do those things that uh, make them happy, as long as they're within the realm of normal, if someone says, I want a hip replacement so I can run an ultra marathon, I say, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have a surgery that can help me do that. Um, but when, when their quality of life is affected to the point that they can't do the things that make them happy, that's when most people will, will turn to the replacement. And, and it's after they have tried these non-operative things, with, which oftentimes will get them back to doing what they want to do. If you can do the things you want to do, then the pain is after. How does that affect the decision? Uh, if typically, typically, we can manage that pain afterwards better than we can during. And so it's really when some people, the pain afterwards will be so severe it will keep them from doing it. But it's typically when the discomfort of doing that activity stops them from doing it that people start looking at options for more, more invasive uh, treatment options. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little more about the uh, usefulness of Two types of injections. Sure. In the knee. Yep. Knee yeah. Arthritis. Yeah. So there are two main types: um, the steroid injection and then the visco supplementation. So steroid um, is like it's very different from, but also at the base level similar to the same steroids that Barry Bonds takes, uh, and that people may have familiarity with with other inflammatory conditions like um, COPD. Uh, and it takes that medication and focuses it in the joint, so it helps decrease the inflammation in the lining of the joint. Uh, it's usually something relatively straightforward that can be do, done at the bedside or sometimes with the assistance of x-ray depending on the joint. Uh, if it helps people, it usually helps people for uh, a period of months. Sometimes that's three months, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's only a couple weeks. Uh, and in, in some cases, it will break a cycle of inflammation and get people some long-term relief. There is moderate data that that does a good job. Uh, the visco supplementation was designed to be like a loop, so like putting a grease fitting in your knee. Um, we know that biochemically it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, and the best clinical data we have, where we take people, we don't tell them what they're giving them. Half the people get a squirt of salt water, half the people get the visco supplementation, there's, there isn't an appreciable difference between the two. Um, that doesn't mean it's not an option, especially if everything else has been exhausted, people aren't ready for knee replacement. Um, but you may see things like whether or not insurance is going to reimburse that changing as the data progresses about it. Does salt water help? <laughs> so it's uh, so this is interesting. It's very rare that we can do a surgical randomized control trial where you take half the people, you don't tell them whether they're getting real surgery or not. Uh, but they were able to do this down in VA in Texas in the 80s. And they gave half the people uh, an arthroscopic procedure where they go in and they wash things out. For the other half of the people, they made incisions on the knee, they splashed a bunch of water, they never put the, the scope in. They didn't tell people which they had, uh, and there wasn't a significant difference between the two. However, they both got better. So, if you believe the saltwater is going to work, the saltwater is going to work. On that note, we're going to 